Okay, good afternoon. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Um, we're very pleased to have all of you for today's event on the future of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Um, this, for any of you who haven't been at some of our previous events, is part of a series that we're running uh, based on a, a, a project that we, we um, researched and wrote and put out earlier this year called Delivering the Goods, which tries to focus on some of the uh, portions of uh, U.S. energy policy that we think are relevant in the debate uh, as a sort of response to what's happening with U.S. oil uh, production and the infrastructure in the United States and, and actually uh, North America in general and how to respond to some of those changes. Uh, and so we brought the Strategic Petroleum Reserve up as part of that conversation for both um, uh, some of the uh, sort of operational and maintenance and sort of tactical issues that uh, that you see arise from the changing nature of the uh, of the infrastructure in place, uh, and what's happening with infrastructure, both sort of directionally and new uh, new infrastructure here in the United States, um, but also from the broader context of uh, the changing global oil markets and what we would want a strategic petroleum reserve for. Uh, how would we want it to act? How would we like it to act differently than it does today? Uh, and so we. Uh, uh, we note that this was a, a major feature of the Quadrennial Energy Review, uh, as well as um, we've seen sort of um, more and more sort of policy discussions, both on the Hill uh, and within the administration, sort of discussing this issue. And so uh, we're very pleased to have all of our panelists uh, here today. I want just very quickly, our safety moment, uh, if there is an incident or an event, uh, unplanned, uh, uh, an emergency where you need to evacuate the building, you guys are in great shape because you have a line of sight as to get out of the building, just sort of go down the stairs out the front door where you came from and please, you know, uh, congregate on the green space across the street. Uh, if that uh, uh, area is not available, just sort of go out the door to the back and then there's uh, there's uh, exit pathways that lead to an alleyway and similarly you can go out the front. So we don't plan that to happen, but want you all to be uh, safe. Um, today's event is being webcast and so very much on the record. Um, we're really, really pleased to have uh, Chris Smith, the Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy, uh, here today to talk a little bit about uh, his perspective on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the work that they're doing uh, to evaluate uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in this uh, uh, broader uh, strategic context. Uh, and we'll start with some comments from him and then have uh, Q&A and then a bit of a panel discussion uh, to evaluate some of these other aspects that I talked about a little bit earlier. So, Chris, thanks very much. Welcome. <clears throat> so, uh, thanks so much, Sarah, for that, that kind introduction. Um, I've actually I've been here to a CSIS, I think, three times over the last four or five weeks. So, uh, this is feeling like a, my, my home away from home, but it's, uh, uh, this is always a, just a great gathering of um, decision makers and subject matter experts. And I see just lots and lots of familiar faces in the room. So, uh, thanks for, for coming and talking to what we think is a, is a really important uh, really important issue. I'm also uh, really uh, thrilled to be joined with such a, by such a great uh, group of panelists. I'm going to be followed by, by uh, Bob Corbin, who runs our Strategic Petroleum Reserve as our Deputy Assistant Secretary. He's going to provide some, some more detailed comments uh, to follow up on some of the, the higher level uh, things I'll talk, uh, talk about. Um, also, we'll be followed by Martin Talent from uh, Incest Energy, but from uh, Martin Young from the uh, IEA and from the uh, the very talented uh, Kevin Book, who uh, writes about our program. So um, that's who will be, uh, be following, following us up here. So um, uh, just, uh, I guess, a couple of, of comments on the, on the, uh, on the big picture. Uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was created uh, back in the, uh, the 70s in response to uh, some very specific uh, physical disruptions of oil supply uh, coming to the United States or coming out of the, uh, the Arab uh, oil embargo. So. Uh, a lot of the, the commentary that I'll make here today and that I think you'll hear from your panelists is an observation that since the early 70s, the, the world certainly has, has changed a lot. Uh, and in that the world has changed, we have to constantly be, be constantly being reevaluating uh, SPRO's mission, its, or its purpose, our vision for what it can accomplish, and what comes along with that are the investments that you have to make uh, within the reserve on an ongoing basis to make sure it, it remains relevant not only physical infrastructure, but also the legislative authority that allows you to use the uh, Strategic Petroleum away, Reserve in a way that's, uh, that's effective. So we've, um, this is a timely topic. Uh, we've been kind of in the, in the news here recently. I was 
Uh, I just testified before the House Energy and Commerce uh, Committee on, on this very topic. Uh, I think of all the issues that we, we deal with, with with Congress, with all of our various issues within the Office of Fossil Energy, uh, this is an area in which I think there's uh, some consistent thought between uh, our uh, our office and and uh, the uh, and that, that particular congressional uh, committee on doing some studies to make sure that we are uh, staying up to date and staying staying relevant. So uh, I think there's some some points of agreement there. Uh, we also recently awarded contracts to repurchase uh, 4.2 million barrels of oil, uh, which should be back in the reserve by the end of July. And this is repurchasing essentially oil that we had sold uh, in our recent test sale that we executed in order to uh, ensure that we're ex exercising not only the, the physical capabilities of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but also all the commercial processes that surround um, our ability to withdraw the oil. So on that test sale, so uh, we, we, we sold 5 million barrels uh, out of the reserve, brought in $468 million of, of receipts, and it, it taught us something about, uh, uh, about the capabilities of the, uh, of the facilities. Uh, first of all, I mentioned that the world's changed since this uh, reserve was first put in place. First of all, we're, we're producing more oil uh, now, certainly, than we were producing in, in, in recent years past. For the first time in decades, we are producing more barrels domestically here in the United States than we're importing from other countries, which I think is an enormously positive thing for uh, energy security, for, for job creation, uh, for all the things that we care about uh, within the, uh, the Department of Energy. Uh, what it's also done is caused uh, some of the, uh, the pipelines that used to run from south to north and uh, carry potentially oil from the Spro to, to uh, to areas in which the oil would be needed. Uh, those pipes now run from north to south. There are pipes that used to run from, from um, east to west that would now run from west to east. Uh, the makeup of the refineries in the terms of the, the barrels that they use uh, in order to, uh, for the refining operations has, has changed over time. It's gone, gotten progressively heavier. And indeed, those uh, refiners have spent billions of dollars to upgrade refineries so that they are they're ready to use different suites of, of, of crude. At the same time, we've got a lighter and lighter uh, portfolio of oil that would potentially be going into, uh, into those refineries uh, as we're producing more light sweet crude in South Texas out of uh, the Eagle Ford, uh, Eagle Ford field and out of uh, the Bakken field in, in North Dakota. So a lot of things have changed since uh, uh, over the, last, the past few years and the, the, the test sale you know, toss a number of things. First, we identified some, some challenges and some bottlenecks. And in the, our most recent budget that the president has, uh, has submitted in our congressional justification, we've, we've requested uh, an additional $57 million of funds that would be dedicated to uh, covering some of that uh, deferred maintenance and also uh, fixing some of those bottlenecks that we, that we observed, which we think is uh, really important work for us to tackle. And, and Bob will be talking about that in, in a bit more detail when, when he gets up here on stage. Uh, subsequent to the sale, we, uh, we created a one million barrel uh, refined product reserve in the Northeast. And this was largely in response to uh, challenges that we saw in the aftermath of uh, Superstorm Sandy. And so uh, we, we created, we've got four different locations and, and three different sites uh, one million barrels of, of gasoline that's in, in, in place in case of, of future, uh, future disruptions. Um, so on the Spro in, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico, this is a, you know, it's a complex operation. You know, I, I periodically get to, uh, get to engage in, in uh, uh, different types of exercises where we, we look at uh, potential disruption scenarios coming out of uh, various cases of unrest around the world, and you know we get to participate in those and show how the the spro might uh, lead towards our being able to ensure energy security and those are always interesting exercises for me because for folks who who don't work with the the strategic petroleum reserve on a day by day basis there's this idea that it's this you know enormous bathtub full of oil that you push a big red button and all the oil comes out to the market and the market's supplied um, it's actually a whole lot more more complicated than that. Uh, there's lots of infrastructure. There's caverns to maintain. Uh, there's uh, pumps to maintain. Uh, these are these are very 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 complex uh, 
complex facilities. And you have to make sure that on an ongoing basis that you're thinking about what look, the subsurface looks like, you're thinking about the well bores that uh, you use to produce oil and to push brine down into the caverns, that you're taking care of, your, of all your surface infrastructure, and that's a, a critical thing to do. Um, when I was testifying before the uh, House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee uh, just a few days ago, uh, at one point, uh, Chairman Whitfield made a, a comment about needing to keep up with maintenance and, and I think uh, referred to the, the, the SPRO as being in a state of disrepair. Um, and I could, I could just see our, our Deputy Assistant Secretary kind of leaping through the screen when he, when he made that comment because, uh, you know, to make clear that, you know, we are, we are keeping those facilities, you know, uh, uh, up and running uh, using the, the capabilities that we have uh, and the budgetary authority that we have in place right now. So uh, that certainly does not accurately characterize, I think, the, the state of operation there. In fact, we've got a tremendous team down in the Gulf of Mexico that's doing, doing wonderful, wonderful work. And every time we've had a drawdown, every time we've had a test sale, uh, we've been able to accomplish a mission. So we're thinking about staying mission focused and being able to, to accomplish the things that we need to accomplish. But at the same time, uh, the world has changed and some of, these, some of this infrastructure has aged. Uh, there are things that we have to do on, uh, on, on an ongoing basis, and we are going to be accomplishing a review to think about what are the specific tasks that we need to accomplish to make sure that uh, you know, not only are we, we taking care of any deferred maintenance we have in place, but also that we're remaining relevant and we're making appropriate changes uh, to, to meet the mission in the future. So the, uh, most of you are aware that the, we've just released, the White House just released its uh, first quadrennial, uh, quadri quadrennial energy review, or a QER, this rolls off the tongue a little more, a little more easily. Uh, so our first QER that looks at energy issues uh, across the board from, from policy to, uh, to, to, to infrastructure. And the QER did talk specifically about uh, challenges with the, within the SPRO and made some, some very specific recommendations about uh, things we need to do uh, going forward. Uh, amongst those recommendations were recommendations that had to do with infrastructure, uh, with the facilities, and also recommendations that have to do with the uh, legislative authority that we have for, for releases. So I'll talk very briefly about each of those in turn. Uh, happy to field some questions, and then uh, Bob will, will talk in, in more detail about some of the facilities and some of the, uh, some of the challenges and, and opportunities we have to make targeted strategic investments for, for facilities. Uh, first, when we, when we think about new facilities, when we think about new investments, we kind of split those up into two, into two broad categories. The first is a category of, of life extension. The, uh, la the last life extension process that we went, went through began back in the mid-90s and was completed some 15 years ago. Uh, that life extension, the, the focus on that was on standardization uh, it was not on replacement of facilities. And so some of the equipment that we have in place, although we're doing everything we can to make sure that using the, the funds that we have to, at our disposal, we're keeping it mission ready, but some of that stuff is, is 10, 10 years past its, its shelf life. There is a, a fair amount of work that we'd have to do in terms of replacements of, of various surface equipment that we have on site uh, to ensure that we extend the life of the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve to uh, to, to its kind of uh, its next period. Uh, the second series of investments that the QER envisions is, are investments that would have to do with distribution capability. We, we, we talk in terms of how many barrels we can push out of the SPRO, out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is really a function of uh, pipes and pumps and well bore capacity, you know, how much you can actually push out of, the, out of these, uh, these salt caverns. There is an entirely separate discussion about how many incremental barrels that you can put on the market, which is uh, more of a, uh, an issue about infrastructure that gets the oil from the, its caverns at our four different sites and, and into global markets, and how can you do that in a way that does not disrupt domestic production so that when you have a release of the SPRO, you're not actually backing in those barrels uh, that you would otherwise be producing already here domestically in the United States. And, you don't want an outcome in which you have a release that backs in barrels that would be coming from uh, domestic fields anyway. So uh, that would be a, and certainly a, a, an undesirable outcome. And there is a look that we'll be doing at 
you know, what facilities need to be in place to ensure that the capability of getting incremental barrels into the market is consistent with our capability of pushing uh, oil out of the caverns themselves. And so that's two different questions. And so that, that uh, issue of increased distribution capacities is the second issue that we look at within the, um, the, the QER. And last, uh, there's an issue about the caverns themselves. Uh, you know, caverns, we lose capacity uh, both uh, naturally over time because the, the, these, these salt domes, domes do move over time in relation to the, the cap rock that, 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 that holds them in place. Uh, you do you lose capacity through creep every year, and you also use, lose capacity through uh, the operations of the field, through well work, workovers when you when you uh, depressurize these caverns, you, 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 you create a, a phenomenon by which you lose some of that capacity because the, the caverns actually sh change uh, shape and, and their geometry over time. Uh, so both natural induced uh, creep are things that we're concerned about. Uh, so we have to think about what is the future of investments we have to make uh, over time to ensure that we maintain the capacity that we need to have in place. Um, lastly, the QER does also talk about the authorities that we have to release oil. The initial authorities that, uh, that govern uh, what we can do within uh, SPRO are, are dictated by EPCA. And what we've seen you know, since you know, over the past decades is a number of changes, uh, a number of amendments, uh, 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 a number of, of, of other type of adjustments to our, our authorities, such that now you don't, have a, you, know, you don't have a single, clear, transparent, unambiguous set of authorities that are suited to the challenges of today, uh, what you do is have, you have a past packed work of changes that came from uh, the environment of the 70s that may or may not match what we need to do uh, right now, uh, today in 2015. Uh, of particular note are there's, uh, you know, we now have the crude reserve in the Gulf of Mexico. We also have product reserves on the East Coast. The way that you would use crude in an emergency differs from the way that you would use product and those differences need to be uh, clear and well expressed. The SPRO is a national resource that deals with global markets, whereas the Northeast uh, uh, reserves, product reserves are regional uh, reserves. And so there's a difference between uh, national uh, interests and regional interests, and that needs to be covered in the, um, uh, in the legislation, in our authorities. And lastly, uh, we think that we need to have the, the authority to act, uh, the unambiguous authority to, to act preemptively uh, so that we can, uh, we can act in ahead uh, of, of, of events that might, uh, might impact our energy security and our economy. And so those are, are, are the, the broad category of, of, of uh, issues that are addressed in, in the QER that we think are important. Uh, so we've, we've already kicked off a comprehensive review of, uh, of the SPRO, not only the fiscal infrastructure and investments we need to make in infrastructure, but also issues of, of, uh, of authorities, uh, release authorities. Uh, it's our view that that will take us uh, somewhere in the order of magnitude of a, of a year to, to accomplish. Uh, it's something we're already working on, and, and, I, and I had the opportunity to discuss that with, uh, with the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, a few days ago. And so I think there's alignment there on the need to do that type of, that type of look. Uh, so with that, that's a, kind of an overview of what I think we wanted to, uh, to, to cover in, in, in terms of uh, what we think the important issues are for this bro going forward, both technically and, and strategically. And with that, I'd, I'd be happy to yeah. take a moment and take some questions. Yeah, you want to come have a seat? Okay. Thanks very much, Chris, for the overview. And I think that um, sort of the combination of the, th the changes that have happened in the last year or so or, or more uh, with some of the recommendations in the QR are precisely what we sort of wanted to get to today. So I, I do appreciate it. Maybe if I could start with a question, and then I'd like to invite the audience to ask a question as well. If you do, please just sort of raise your hand and then wait for a microphone. Uh, that would be helpful. I mean, one of the things I was particularly curious about, and this gets a little bit into the political elements of it, which is um, unambiguous authority to preemptively release from the SPRO seems like a very interesting construct, right? And so I think 
the, the SPR is, is a, a couple of different things, right? It's a very useful tool that was designed for a particular purpose, but over its history perhaps has never been used for the purpose it was designed for, right? But it has been used in another, a number of other instances. And I remember when I was working at the Department of Energy, some fairly robust conversations about the ability or the desirability of using the SPR for price-related supply disruptions, right? So supply disruptions sort of characterized by scarcity versus supply disruptions characterized by sort of a price impact, right? Is this, I mean, is this a very direct signal that we are now thinking about using the SPR as a more sophisticated price intervention type of tool? Or is it really just to sort of put on the table that, that we have a, an ability to see supply disruptions or an advanced understanding of them and need authority sooner? All right. Well, that's that's actually a it's a great question and, and actually a pretty pretty complicated one. So, um, I, I won't endeavor to thread too many careful legal needles here in my response because you know one of the things I, I brought up in, in in my discussion was that when you look at the legislation, it's it's now this patchwork of, of fixes and, and amendments that have happened since the EPCA was first put in place, and if you if you got three really smart, well informed uh, lawyers sitting up here on this panel and you had them all give their their view on what exactly you can do and when you you get a various you get a number of responses. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to duck part of that right because uh, I don't want to I don't want to pick you know one particular interpretation. Okay. But certainly what what I will say is that the the world of today is different than the world of the 70s in which you know the primary concern was you can't get this barrel to the Gulf of Mexico, therefore you need a, Gulf of, a barrel in the Gulf of Mexico waiting to send to that refinery to replace that barrel that's not coming because somebody blocked it. Uh, the, the world looks a little bit different now. Uh, we're still uh, you know, focused on disruptions, and you know, there's, there's uh, lots of discussion on what you know, a disruption is and what it means and you know, when is disruption a disruption. But certainly, I, I think our view is that the, you know, the the, the way that the law needs to be written needs to take away some of this ambiguity. Uh, it does need to be clearer, and I think we knew, do need to have a, clear, a clearer shared view about how we would how we'd use these authorities and what it is for. So, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, a bunch of people could answer that question in a, in a, in a bunch of different ways, I think is, is indicative of the fact that we need to have this discussion about, you know, what exactly does it mean and when, when can you use it. Um, and that will help us to be, to be more flexible, more flexible. But also, I think will make it a uh, a more effective, a more effective tool for all the things we do care about. Okay. All right. uh, let's see over here. Just wait for the microphone, please. State name and affiliation, and if your question can be in the form of a question, that would be excellent. Thank you. Hi, Emily Meredith from Energy Intelligence, right. and the question is related, and that is, you know, how is the DOE thinking about? the inevitable questions of, you know, the role of potential manipulation and pricing speculation in price triggers, if you're talking about using a price trigger to release additional barrels. All right. So I, I, I certainly didn't say anything as specific as uh, a price trigger or that we're envisioning a specific uh, a price trigger. So that's, that's not the message I want, I want to send. Um, you know, this is still a focus on on disruptions and what disruptions might mean to the to the U U.S. economy, um, it's you know one will would observe, however, that just having these barrels and having it uh, having them in place to to be able to move into the market does help us to to send signals that protect the U.S. economy. So uh, in that disruption can impact the price of the U.S. economy. We want to make sure that we've got an effective way to to respond and protect uh, national security, protect energy security, protect our economic interests. Now, how that would operate, I think, would is actually the very subject of the discussion because right now there 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 are some ambiguities in, in the way that the legislation's written, in that it is you know again over time a, a patchwork of of fixes that have been put in place since the this pro was initially created. So, uh, you know, part of these will part of the answer to that question will come out in the review that we're doing and and making the the recommendations more specific. Bob McNally with the Rapid End Group. Uh, I'm going to pursue the same line of questioning, uh, if you don't mind, uh, and thank you for a great, great talk and for convening. Uh, while your point that the oil market and our position in it is very different, is well taken, I think it's also true that 
few things still terrify a politician more than a rising price at the pump. And so as you think about what I understand to be not only clarifying but sort of giving more discretion uh, to any administration as to when to use the SPR, are you open to and thinking about mechanisms such as price triggers or some other mechanism so that we don't have politicized use of SPR to attempt to smooth price fluctuations in what can sometimes be a volatile global oil market? All right. So um, again, certainly, uh, I, I've, I've only said the word price triggers in response to tr price trigger <laughs> being used in a question, right? So. Uh, in that I've even used those two words, it's because I'm referring to the words having been used by someone who's asked me a question. So um, that was that was not that was not part of my uh, of of uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that 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 was not part of of uh, of the uh, of the way that I've characterized this. So again, the, you know, not a the, the thing that we want to accomplish is to to take what we think is a again a, a messy patchwork set of fixes and turn it into something that's more elegant. Um, what that means in terms of the uh, of how it operates would be the the subject of the review that we're we're making itself. But uh, you know this is not a you know it's not a pivot that we're signaling that you know you're going to have any sort of more activist policy. I mean that's that's not what we're saying. Um, we we think that the you know this is you know this is a an important insurance policy for the United States. We think it's a it's a critically important resource. Uh, if you look at oil prices now, you, you see the markets are, are very well supplied. Right, uh, but it is uh, a period of, of great uncertainty in a lot of areas. I mean, you, you throw a, a dart at the at the map, and you you're going to land somewhere that you know might impact the energy security in the future. So we have to make sure that we're able to use this resource in a way that's effective, uh, that gives us the flexibility to. I mean, this is the one thing that we have that we can we can use to ensure that we we can respond to issues of of energy scarcity. So, um, so that, that's that's what we're trying to accomplish, and you know. Nothing as specific as, you know, some sort of market trading mechanism. That's not not what we're we're proposing. Doug Hengel, the German Marshall Fund. Does your review include a look at the size of the SPR, given the increased production in the United States and corresponding decline in imports? Maybe we don't need right. as large an SPR as we have now. Um, uh, so, thanks, Doug. Uh, uh, great question. So, indeed, the the review will look at at the size of the SPRO, how big it is. So, you know, uh, so yes. So, size, quality, composition, strategic yeah. relevance, all that. Uh, indeed, right. So, I mean, the review will look at you know how the SPRO is configured, uh, sweet versus sour. You know, how many barrels we should have, what sort of infrastructure we need to have in place. Uh, it, it could be a comprehensive review that looks at. Facilities, what's in the facilities, and what's the legislation allows us to get stuff in the facilities, out of the facilities, and out into the, the global market. So it's going to be, it is going to be a, a comprehensive review. Well, I know we've had you here four times in the last uh, not too recent past, uh, talking about Africa, talking about the Arctic, talking about a lot of different things. So we appreciate your time, and I know you've got a, a bit of a stop. But um, I, I just wanted to ask, you know, we're going to ask this of uh, Kevin. Kevin a little bit later on the panel, but you obviously, you know, secretaries come out, QER has stated you need congressional support and assistance right. for this. You've mentioned working with Congress. How, how uh, what are your early signals and, and your own level of optimism for, you know, uh, what what's the appetite for reforming the SPR, right? I mean, there's the stewardship issue, there's the functionality issue, and then there's, do we need something that's completely new and different and out of the box? I mean, what kind of uh, aptitude for that kind of thinking are you receiving in your conversations? Well, I'm uh, I'm interested to see what what Kevin thinks about the hearing. Right? Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, overall, I mean, I I, uh, I mean, I, I thought it was a fairly constructive discussion. I mean, uh, the, the there's interest in the review, and uh, I mean, this is one of the cases where they, um, I'm appearing for this this committee. They want us to do a strategic review of the of the reserve, and we've already started a strategic re review of the reserve. And we could talk a lot about well. Here's what's going to be included, and, and that was that lined up with I think uh, what the interest is. Now the uh, the devil's in the details. Uh, you know, once we get the review done, and there's going to be a point of well, what do you do next? Uh, I mean, we've we've got a you know we we have a very strong view on things that we need to be doing now uh, in this president's budget. We requested an additional 57 million dollars for deferred maintenance. We think that's important. 
uh, throughout the, so the fossil energy budget, so I, I run the Office of Fossil Energy at the Department of Energy. We, uh, uh, we, we had an increase in the, in the request that we had this year over, over, over previous years. It was close to what was funded in the omnibus bill. Uh, we think this is an area of, of I think, uh, you know, potential agreement between uh, the administration and, and Congress. Uh, we're going to advocate very forcefully, I think, for the, the budget request that we made. We think it's, it's appropriate. We think it's, it's consistent with what the nation needs. And indeed, it's consistent with some of the signals that we've already gotten from, from Congress. So um, the SPRO is a big asset. You know, it's an important insurance policy. Uh, it, there's a cost to running it, and uh, you know it's it's uh, you know with with all these things you you can agree on everything and, except for the price sometimes right and so that's a uh, that's often a, a point of discussion but uh, uh, overall at least at this at this at this point we're thinking strategically about strategically about the importance of the reserve uh, it's my hope that we're able to to communicate how important we we feel this is and that we'll get some some concurrence and we'll agree that we need to to do the things we need to do in order to make sure that this is the, uh, the asset of the future, the resource of the future, that it's consistent with the challenges that we face now and not the challenges that we faced back in the, in the 70s. Yeah. Well, Chris, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. We hope when you're done with your review, you'll come back and share some of your findings and what, what, uh, what the, the landscape looks like then. Um, right. But please join me in thanking Chris for joining us today. <laughs> and if you're able to stick around, Chris, uh, okay. You will, great, okay. Um, I'd like to in invite the rest of the panelists uh, up for the rest of the conversation uh, that will get started. Um, when we were, come on up. Uh, when we were thinking about how to approach uh, the discussion today, we thought we would take a step back and do a little bit of 101 uh, on what uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve actually is and how it functions. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better person than Bob Corbin, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for uh, the Office of Petroleum Reserves at USDOE, who um, uh, is the one who explains all this stuff to me. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful to bring him here and talk a little bit about uh, what the SPR is uh, and how it functions uh, from, from all the work that he's doing and how it's being maintained. He can go on and on and talk more in depth on all of the different attributes of what he's going to talk about, but we asked him to sort of keep it to a, a high level, though useful overview. Uh, and then we've invited uh, Martin Young, uh, who is the head of emergency policy division at the International Energy Agency, to do something a little bit similar, a hybrid of what the strategic stock systems is, uh, and, then, uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, how they're thinking about the challenges of a changing uh, global oil market and environment and, and the strategic stocks in light of that. Uh, and then we've invited Martin Tallett uh, back, who's the president and founder of NSYS Energy. Um, uh, he was actually just here uh, at the last one of these, uh, but one of the conversations we had after uh, that was about all of the work that NSYS has done on looking at the SPR and uh, in a strategic context, right? So the work that they've done over uh, many decades to look at uh, uh, the SPR's ability to respond to a variety of oil supply disruptions and how uh, how we might think about that challenge that you know Chris and his team are, and all the folks over at DOE are grappling with uh, about thinking about that going forward. And then uh, uh, much already reviewed, uh, Kevin Book, who uh, is a, a partner at Clearview uh, Energy and uh, an associate here at CSIS's energy program, is going to uh, talk about the politics of all of this uh, and uh, and what are the key questions that people who have authority to change these things uh, might be uh, thinking about and and uh, what the pol political dynamics of that are. So without further ado, um, uh, Bob, we'll uh, get started with your presentation and then uh, move on. Do you want to speak? Well, thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, attending this event today. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we were asked to sort of condense our presentation, so um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the SPR. I'll call it an SPR 101. Uh, for some of you, this may be stuff that you already know. For others, it, it may help you out a lot. Uh, certainly during the question and answer period, I'd be happy to take any questions that 
are perhaps in more detail than what I'm going to cover here. Okay, so as Chris Smith mentioned, um, the, the SPR was established back in 1975 uh, as a direct result of the Arab oil embargo of 1973. Uh, it was established uh, by the Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975, and its mission is to uh, ensure U.S. energy security uh, through the reduction of impacts of supply disruptions and also to carry out U.S. obligations under the International Energy Program. Um, I guess the key point with this is uh, you need to think of the SPR, it, it's a national insurance policy. Uh, you know, like any insurance policy, you hope you never have to use it, but if you need it, it's there for you. With regard to release authorities, there's essentially four ways that oil can move out of the SPR uh, by statute. Um, two of those require a presidential finding. In other words, there has to be a, a written uh, finding from the President of the United States. And two of the authorities can actually come from the Secretary of Energy. Um, from the President, you, you can have a full drawdown authority under Section 161D of EPCA. Um, and it's basically to address a severe uh, petroleum supply interruption. And then when you go into the law itself, the um, there's a sub-definition of, of what constitutes that. And it goes back to one of the points that, that was asked of Chris Smith before um, with regards to the need to change some of the authorities. Um, and, and, and one of the keys to that is if you note under the severe energy supply interruption, um, it, it talks about a severe increase in price of petroleum products has already resulted from such an emergency situation. So in other words, um, something has to have already occurred. And, and this is probably one of the biggest areas uh, of concern when you, when you look at this. Um, the second authority, it's a limited drawdown. Uh, it requires a presidential finding. It's limited in the sense that it, it's a maximum of um, 30 million barrels and no more than 60 days of the, of the release authority. Um, and, and it also is limited if, if the SPR actually has less than 500 million barrels of inventory, you, you cannot use this authority. Um, on the secretary side, uh, the secretary has authority to issue a release uh, in the event of conducting a test sale or drawdown. And uh, also for an oil exchange, um, an exchange can be used to either acquire oil or to alter the mix of oil in the SPR. Um, this authority has been used historically when there are emergency situations, think hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico that have uh, taken out infrastructure and have not allowed refineries to actually uh, maintain their inventory levels. So on an emergency basis, the SPR can provide oil to these refineries and then we get our oil back over time plus premium barrels. Uh, very quickly, um, this, is, this slide just shows uh, all of the different oil releases that the SPR has had over its existence. Um, we have had three drawdown actions, all of which were IEA collective actions, uh, three test sales, including the test sale uh, in the spring of 2014, and then uh, a total of eight exchanges, seven of which were related to emergency requests. Uh, this slide just wanted to show people where, where our different field sites are located. The SPR actually has four um, storage and distribution sites located along the Gulf Coast, two in Texas, two in Louisiana. We also have a project management office in New Orleans that actually oversees the day-to-day -day operations of our field sites. Some site information, um, four field sites. St uh, storage and distribution facilities. We have a total of 60 operational uh, caverns. Uh, our design capacity is 713.5 million barrels. We currently have an inventory of just about 691 million barrels. We'll add 4.2 million barrels more with the coming oil purchase. And our drawdown rates from our facilities, uh, maximum drawdown rates design-wise, are 4.4 million barrels per day. And as Chris pointed out, that's the the rate at which we can push oil out of our caverns. And then we get into um, 
the entire distribution issue, which is very, very different. With regard to storage, uh, I'm sure most of you know uh, all of our crude oil is stored underground in um, salt caverns. These are essentially um, caverns that have been dug out of, uh, you know, salt, it dug, leached out with, with fresh water um, from salt domes. Um, the cavern shape that you see in this diagram is a typical cavern shape for, an, for a DOE designed cavern. We do have a number of caverns that were originally acquired when the SPR was established. Uh, we call those our orally storage reserve caverns. The shapes are very, very different. Um, on DOE designed caverns, this particular shape, from the surface to the top of the cavern, um, typically 2,200 feet down, the cavern depth itself is about 2,000 feet, about 200 feet in diameter. Um, these caverns typically hold about 12 million barrels of oil. Um, they're shaped like cylinders. In some of the um, early storage reserve caverns, the, sh the shapes are very different. We have one cavern, we, we call it the flying saucer cavern because it, its shape, if you looked at a plan view of it, looks exactly like a flying saucer. Um, we have other very odd shapes. Um, our largest cavern, which was one of the early storage reserve caverns acquired, holds 37 million barrels of crude oil. The other, the other point that I'll make is the operating costs for, for underground cavern storage uh, are less than 25 cents per barrel per year. Uh, we annually benchmark uh, our costs against um, 14 international countries at, at an international benchmarking event, and our costs are actually the lowest costs per barrel per year out in the industry. Um, purpose of this slide, I just wanted to explain to some people basically how we move our oil. Um, essentially, if you look at the caverns itself inside the salt dome, the black is the oil, sits on top of, um, the green is brine, it's basically saturated salt water. Um, when we want to pump oil out of the caverns, we actually um, use raw water injection pumps and we pull raw water from a, a fresh water source and we pump it down into the bottom of the caverns. Um, the raw water essentially then pushes or displaces the oil up out of the, the, um, the oil, the oil um, well bore. And then from there, it goes into our crude oil uh, pumps where we get it up to pipeline pressure, we get it out, and then we can distribute it out through um, our distribution networks. Um, if we are filling our caverns with oil like we will be doing with the purchase, it's just the opposite. Um, our oil goes back into the caverns, it displaces the brine that's in the bottom of the cavern. The brine then goes out and uh, goes to a settling pond um, to skim off any oil from the interface, uh, to let um, solids settle out. And then from there, uh, it is either pumped out to the Gulf of Mexico for two of our sites, or it gets disposed of in underground injection wells at two of our other sites. And um, all of our brine that, that goes out is, is subject to EPA permitting requirements and testing. This slide uh, is just a very broad view of our um, distribution groups. Uh, within the SPR, we actually have three separate distribution groups. Uh, the one farthest to the west is the Seaway group, the middle group is the Texoma group, and the, uh, the one farthest to the east is the Capline group. Um, within these distribution groups, we have a total of 17 sales points that we can sell our oil from. Out of those 17 points, five of them are at marine terminals and 12 of them are pipeline connection points. Um, during a drawdown, when we issue a, a notice of sale, the notice of sale actually tells potential purchasers which sites and which sale points we would sell our oil from. However, um, what many people don't know is once uh, the purchasers have been identified and the sale is completed, it is actually the purchaser's responsibility for making their own transportation arrangements. So in other words, they bid on the oil, they bid on the delivery point that they want to pick the oil up at, and they make the decision whether they want to 
move the oil via pipeline or via marine vessel. Um, with regards to the test sale, um, the test sale was actually conducted uh, within the Texoma distribution group. Um, that was the group that we had the most concerns about with changes in infrastructure and the additional domestic production. And uh, uh, we, in our test sale report to Congress uh, that we turned in after the sale, we had a number of lessons learned there, uh, including the need to enhance our distribution infrastructure. All right, final slide with regard to current initiatives that we've got going on in the SPR right now. Um, the crude oil purchase, uh, as Chris Smith already mentioned and, and I touched upon, um, this, this buyback of oil required by law when you do a test sale and, and to the extent funds are available in the SPR petroleum account, we have to buy back petroleum products, which can include crude oil. Um, in this particular case, we had sufficient funds left where, uh, with the price of crude, we were able to buy back uh, just about 4.2 million barrels uh, of crude oil. It's uh, all sweet oil, and it's all going to our Bryan Mound site. And in fact, our first deliveries are scheduled for this week. Um, with our long-term strategic review, um, again, the idea is to position the SPR to address potential oil market vulnerabilities over the next 25 years. Uh, in order to do this, there are a number of topical areas that we need to cover. We have to look at the evolving oil market vulnerabilities. Um, we need to look at things such as the size, the composition, and the geography of the reserve. And when we say composition, that also looks at uh, talking about looking at the potential need for additional product reserves. Um, we need to look at our infrastructure, our storage, and our distribution requirements. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, our, our infrastructure is aging. In, some, in many cases, we have equipment that was original equipment when the SPR was established back in the late 70s. Um, it is, in, in certain cases, in need of replacement. Um, our caverns, some of which are the original um, early storage reserve caverns that were acquired, date back, in some cases, almost 60 years old, including their well bores. Um, Distribution-wise, we did the test sale. We noticed that uh, we need to enhance our, our distribution system. And so, um, and then mixed in with that is then you look at also the resource requirements uh, that affect uh, all these changes affect. So these are going to be the general topics that we would be covering in this strategic review. Um, and as Chris mentioned, it'll probably take us about a year to do this. It's going to be fairly comprehensive. Uh, refined petroleum product reserve studies. Um, we've got two separate um, studies that we're looking at right now. We've initiated a review uh, in conjunction with our Energy Policy and Systems Analysis Office at DOE to uh, determine the need for, potentially for a, a re refined petroleum product reserve in Pad 5. Um, for those of you who do not know Pad 5, that are, that's the three West Coast states, Oregon, Washington, California, Nevada, Arizona, Alaska, and Hawaii. Um, in addition to that, we are ready to initiate a revalidation of a 2010 internal uh, study that was done by DOE that looked at the need for an RPPR in the southeast United States. Uh, and, and we anticipate that that, that revalidation uh, will commence sometime later this summer. Uh, in addition to that, our office is also uh, doing some work regarding uh, an analysis to look at uh, uh, feasibility for enhancing our marine distribution capability in all three of our distribution groups, uh, looking at um, options potentially to uh, in, in, uh, in enhance our terminal capabilities, either through new terminals or connecting up with existing terminals. Um, with that, um, I thank you very much, and once the other panelists are done, I will be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Okay, so Martin's going to take us into sort of the transition to the global strategic stock system, a little bit of an introduction to it too as well. Thank you. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to hear, be here to be able to talk, give a little bit of perspective from the IA's viewpoint. Um, 
just to get a um, little bit of an overview, I'm going to provide a little bit of context the way that we see things, then to answer the three areas that um, Sarah raised on, um, when putting this uh, workshop together about the structure and um, function, possible reforms, and the role in the global energy system. First of all, from an IA perspective, we don't just look purely at the US SPR. We're actually seeing total US stocks, so including industry stocks. At the moment, our latest data for end of January is that US has got 1.9 billion barrels. Within the total IEA system, we've got, of all our member country stocks, some 4.1 billion barrels. So US stocks, as part of that, are some 46%. One particular important issue that I think there's a little bit of what you might term, what lawyers might term as loose language. Um, lots of people consider that IA, all IA members have a strategic petroleum reserve like the US. That ain't the case. Um, there are six countries which have government um, reserves, but very of those, I'd say that the only ones that are vaguely like uh, the SPR is actually the Korean and the Japanese versions. Um, the Czech one also is perhaps a little bit similar, but also holds product. And the New Zealand one is nothing like it at all. It just holds options to buy um, product stocks. There's a wide diversity of different models across um, the IA membership. Um, there's been a lot of move to agency stocks. These can be government-owned, operated, but they can also be industry-owned and operated and they tend to focus a lot more on product stocks. And we also have industry stocks where obligations are placed on industry operators. Uh, and the diagram shows we have a combination of various models in between. And beneath that, we also have the commercial and operational stocks. Um, one interesting point to note, and I'm sure you're probably all well aware, is that there are two countries which are developing SPRs very similar uh, to the US version, that's China and India. So, on to the um, structure and uh, function. As has clearly been mentioned, the SPR was set up to be an insurance policy uh, in the event of serious oil supply disruptions. Um, it retains this functionality, but it needs to adjust to the new market realities. Um, from an IA perspective, we welcome the QER, and we also welcome the test sale, because that's checking to make sure that the SPR can function in the way it's supposed to. Um, one comment here is that the IEA has previously encouraged uh, the US administration to consider holding product stocks as part of the SPR near key demand centers. So we very much welcome the studies that are going to be done as part of the QER. Moving on to the possible reforms, um, we also very much welcome the broader definition that the QER mentions about uh, energy security. This very much aligns with the IEA thinking that energy security is much broader than just oil. Um, it's already been touched upon in some of the comments. Um, we support the flexible wording um, in the EPCA uh, for, for the perspective of um, global disruptions and the anticipatory action. Again, flagging some of the points that actually already been raised. Um, there is a concern that price in of itself should not be a trigger for, for an SPR release. There should be a clear link to an actual, actual or physical disruption. Um, that's a standard viewpoint that the IEA has expressed for a long period of time. Um, I think there's the perception that uh, you'll be disrupting normal market signals that will discourage investment in production and that could make the longer term supply and demand balance worse. Uh, it can also um, reduce your actual stocks when you do have a physical disruption. Um, and for some of our members, actually releasing stocks solely on price is illegal in their legislation. The recommendation on optimizing the SPRs um, Emergency response capability we see as um, business as usual and just making sure it re retains um, operational effectiveness. Um, and as Khalid said, we support the work on the product reserves, but very much like the idea about trying to align the release processes. 
So moving on to the global energy system, um, it's also been touched upon that one of the reasons for the SPR's creation was to comply with the US's commitment to the International Energy Programme, the founding treaty for the IEA. Uh, the US and the SPR are part of that global oil supply system that's coordinated by the, a the IEA. Clearly, the uh, stocks are there to prevent economic harm, not just for the US, but also for all our member countries. And we got together because it was realized that uh, coordinated action together is more effective than individual uncoordinated action. I'd also make the point here that in the IEP, it was a very clear aim that the, uh, the emergency stocks are there to try and stop the use of oil supply as a political weapon. And arguably, you could say that they have been effective in this approach. Bob's already touched upon the three collective actions that we've had, so I won't go into any further on those. But I will highlight the fundamental question that we have is, will the system continue to remain effective? A lot of things have changed since 1974. At that point, OECD countries were responsible for three quarters of demand. Uh, we're actually at the crossover point now. It's 50-50 between OECD and non-OECD. And going forward to 2035, OECD countries are going to be in a minority. We need to update this middle um, chart, uh, but it's trying to show the coverage that the IEA stocks have. Um, back in 1980, the total stocks covered about 55 days of global supply demand. Um, that's coming down. Um, the three additional bits are supposed to show China, India, and ASEAN countries. Um, there's clearly a need to work with these countries going forward. Um, and so we very much welcome things like the, the recent US-China agreement where to, uh, there has been sharing of experience between the SPR, the SPRs of China and the US. And I thank you after that. Thank you. So good afternoon, it's a, it's a pleasure to be back and uh, this time to be talking about the SPR. And uh, so just by, by way of introduction, and I'll carry on until the slides come up. Uh, at NCIS we spent about the last... Uh, just advance, they're all, just, they're all there? Yeah, just keep going. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, all right, there we are. So. Just by, uh, by way of introduction, we spent the last 30-odd years focusing on a kind of global integrated analyses of, of the uh, petroleum downstream system. And one of the uh, things that's done, apart from bringing to us a, a wide array of clients, is to uh, have a, lead us to a history where we've worked on over half a dozen studies for the DOE of both actual and, uh, and hypothetical disruptions, examining the market impacts of different levels of SPR draw, or different mixes in the crude, and so on. And uh, while today uh, we have spent a lot of our time focusing on the major developments here in, in North America, one thing I'd like to do is to drop back, actually, and, and draw on our experience in general. But in fact, one study in particular in 2005 that we undertook uh, of hypothetical disruptions that we were uh, anticipating could occur in, guess what, 2015. And to use that as a way of gauging just how much things have changed. So this is a lot of numbers on this chart, but these were the uh, scenarios that we looked at in 2005. And uh, a couple of important things is across the top, the labelings of the scenarios. Uh, a major Persian Gulf-wide disruption with a military uh, component to it. Uh, that sounds kind of ominously familiar. Uh, a somewhat step-down version of that, Saudi, West Africa, Venezuela, uh, Gulf Coast offshore hurricane, all of these, I think, are still the kinds of scenarios that if we were doing the exercise today, we would select. They're still very much out there, and probably the scale is very much similar to what we were anticipating about 10 years ago. Uh, all the numbers represent the fact that while we focus a lot on the US SPR draw, as Martin just mentioned, uh, in examining a disruption, 
Uh, that's really just one component of the whole thing. You've got the crude loss, but then you typically have maybe NGLs and other streams that are lost as well from the supply. You have the SPR crude oil draw, but that can be part of a total IEA draw. And these days could also include draws from, say, China and India, again, as Martin mentioned. On the supply, on the demand side, uh, if there's a military component, you're going to get changes in the demand mix, more military fuel required. Uh, the losses in demand are going to be worse in the disrupted regions, but spread across the rest of the world, maybe partially offset by product uh, draws from, say, some of the IEA members. Uh, and then at the bottom, too, uh, refining capacity, really a key component that can be major refining losses uh, depending on what the disruption is. So these are the kinds of factors that one has to put together in considering uh, an overall uh, disruption scenario and how it might play out. But before you can do that, uh, you have to uh, consider what the business as usual outlook could be. And looking back to what we did in 2005, uh, this was the base that I said we projected, uh, it was really the EIA, so I can, I can blame the EIA. But um, in the EIA's outlook, uh, they were looking at 2015 as having about 5.5 million barrels a day of U.S. Uh, oil production, crude oil production. Uh, that was where we were in about 2007, 2008. Uh, significant demand growth, and so higher uh, refining throughputs, uh, over 18 million barrels a day, so roughly 3 million barrels a day higher than actual. Uh, and, and also, I think probably uh, we were assuming less uh, biofuels. And so when you add all of those together, uh, we were looking at a situation where we could have anything up to close to 13 million barrels a day of crude oil imports here in 2015, whereas in fact, the number is a little bit over half that, about something around seven in 2014. So this is a much better position uh, that, uh, that we are in than that we thought we'd be in. And, um, and when you look at this on a regional basis, Pad 2, the Midwest, uh, again, a few years ago, we thought that was still going to be vulnerable. If you take vulnerability here, I'm just using Africa plus Middle East plus Venezuelan uh, crude oil uh, imports, uh, that the Midwest, Pad 2, could be vulnerable. That vulnerability is gone, thanks to Canadian pr uh, pr uh, crude oil growth and to domestic light tight oil. Uh, pads 1 and 3, that's the East Coast and the Gulf Coast, uh, very much reduced in terms of vulnerability. The one region that has increased in vulnerability is Pad 5, the West Coast, and that's because there uh, the reductions in regional uh, crude production have been offset by increases in Middle East uh, crude oil imports. So these have um, some pretty far-reaching implications, though. You could look at this picture and say, wow, everything is great. We're in a much better position than we were, uh, that we thought we were going to be. And so there's nothing to do. There's no problems, no issues or challenges. But I think there are. I mean, as previous speakers have touched on, the first one is logistics. Uh, if you have a big SPR draw now, say 4 million barrels a day, you're feeding that crude into an already pretty crowded Gulf Coast market. So it's incremental crude oil movements on top of what's already there. And um, so in addition, uh, a significant part of that crude, maybe 30 or 40%, could have to be moved to pads one and pad five, which means getting it onto the water. And so that has significant implications for the infrastructure needed. Uh, and then there's a question of, of volume, because when we look at those numbers, we're now down below about 2.2, below 3 million, about 2.8 million barrels a day of, quotes, vulnerable crude oil uh, imports. And if we had a 4 million barrel a day SPR draw as part of a coordinated response to a major international disruption, um, we, we would have backed out possibly 2.8 million. We'd have another 1.2 or more left available. And the question is, if you're trying to get that onto international markets in order to have an impact, uh, how do you achieve that? And, and the first thought is, well, then you could displace uh, the non-disrupted imports that were still coming in. Uh, but uh, if you look at that, the issue is that the bulk of the imports are still coming into pad three, secondarily pad 
5 and pad 1, but particularly into pad 3 and 5, those imports are predominantly heavy crude oils. Um, the, the Middle East crude oil is about 30 API gravity. So you look at the other crude oils, they're typically in the 15 to 25 API range, heavy, sour, a lot of them are acidic. Those are not crudes that can readily be reallocated to refineries elsewhere in the world. So they're likely to stay put. So then if you add to that the fact that nearly 40% of the reserves in the SPR are relatively light sweet crude oil, so North Sea type crude oil, reflecting the history going back to the 70s and the 80s, um, then the question becomes, well, given the uh, abundance we have today of light sweet crude being produced here in the country, uh, it's difficult to see where there'd be a market for that SPR suite within the USA. In fact, those crudes are much better fit, really, with European and Asian refineries. And so the implication for that is, since you, it's difficult to budge the remaining he um, heavy crude imports, uh, that in order to, again, get, say, 4 million barrels a day fully into international markets, uh, you'd have to do it directly by exporting the sweet crudes from the SPR, which brings us right into the overall uh, crude oil export debate. Uh, some thoughts about the SPR size and draw rate and makeup. And you know, given this situation, this much improved situation, one could say, and, and obviously the question is being asked, which is do we need an SPR of the current size and draw rate? And certainly a lot of the studies that we did the emphasis was on uh, replacing physical oil, but it was also on a recognition that drawing the SPR down had the impact of reducing international oil prices and thereby reducing harm to the US economy. And one must also say to a lot of other economies around the world as well. So the, clearly there are substantial costs to maintaining the SPR at its current size, but one could argue that because of the scale of the world economy, the US trade with other nations, uh, the, the, the extent, uh, the height of the uh, oil price spikes that we see these days, that there is at least an argument for maintaining uh, that capability at its current level. As long, though, of course, as you've got the logistics and the regulatory frameworks to get the crews out into the markets that can take advantage of them. And just a final point about the, the composition of the SPR. Um, it's been touched on earlier. Clearly, we know we're going to get big hurricanes and damage in the Gulf Coast region and even up the East Coast. And that can really knock out refining capacity. And so even if you don't lose any crude supply, uh, you really need product. And uh, Bob commented on that earlier. Uh, another example is the US West Coast. Uh, if a big disruption starts, by the time there's been an authorization, purchase, shipping around to the West Coast, processing through refineries there, and getting out onto the market, you could be talking six plus weeks. That's a long time to wait. And so, again, that indicates an argument for considering product reserve on the West Coast. And the final point is that we always focus in on the Middle East as the sort of primary vulnerable area. And traditionally there, it was predominantly crude oils that that region exported. What's happening there today is that there's construction going on of literally millions of barrels a day of refining capacity. So increasingly, that region is exporting a mix of crude oils and products. And so our vulnerability or dependency, if you will, is more to that mix. So when you put those together, I think, uh, again, this can sort of reinforce the idea that what is in the SPR uh, needs uh, examination or whether regional ex uh, additional regional SPRs are needed also needs examination. So again, compared to where we thought we were going to be, uh, we're in a way better position courtesy of growth in U.S. production, uh, but there are arguably uh, quite a few challenges and questions that are outstanding. Thank you. Okay, Kevin's going to wrap us up with uh, summarizing a bunch of this and looking at the politics. What do I do? Please help. Don't do that. <laughs> Stop, don't do that. OK, 
Okay, now just put down. Oh, tricky. Down. There I am. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Thanks for the big buildup. I'll try not to let you down as your last speaker in a long series. Uh, it's good to see a lot of friends and familiar faces in the crowd. Um, the questions uh, I'll be discussing today are uh, really a couple of things. Are we overinsured? A uh, quick thought exercise uh, about what, uh, what trying to guess the right level of insurance might be worth. A uh, bit of a discussion about what Congress might be thinking based on recent events. Uh, I think you have a preview of it right there. And uh, products reserves. Uh, really, there's two dimensions to the discussion that are happening uh, very much in public right now. One is the size uh, question. It's come up over and over again. But the second is the composition question. So uh, let's start with the insurance point. Um, days of demand cover is simply uh, looking at the number of barrels in the, in the SPRO and dividing by the net imports of petroleum products the U.S. is, is bringing in. Uh, and uh, the notional 90-day obligation for demand cover uh, import cover under the IEA is a, is a good baseline to sort of ask, what, what does it mean if we're at 140 plus uh, on a trailing 12-month basis? Uh, are we overinsured? Uh, one might argue that, yes, we're, we're, we're overinsured for the world we have today. Uh, that's an argument that we've been hearing not just uh, in the last year, uh, but uh, I can recall at least uh, twice in the last five or six years being on the Hill, uh, listening to members of Congress talk about the very notion of reducing the size of the SPRO which is interesting because I can also remember about 10 years ago uh, being on the Hill, uh, legislation that emerged from the Hill saying that it should be expeditiously increased to its full billion barrel size. Uh, so uh, this, this, again, back to the question of uh, are you sure you're timing it right? One other way to think about the insurance, if you're paying the same amount and your coverage has increased, is that a good deal? Did the deal just get better? Something to think about. Okay, thought experiment number one. Let's look from 85 forward, shortly after the full fill of the SPRO relative to, uh, to, to sort of the, the historical levels. Uh, and let's ask, if on any given month we sold uh, when we were below, uh, we sold when we were above 90 days of net import cover and bought when we were below, and we inflate the dollars uh, from the, either the sale or the purchase uh, into real dollars, uh, on average, was that a winning or a losing proposition? The answer is no, it was a losing proposition. You lost $7 billion dollars uh, on average over the series. Uh, but if I look for the last 60 months, well, that's a different story. I'm $5 billion ahead. Now, I'm not suggesting that we want to trade our security blanket. Uh, Lord knows that there are traders who have more sophisticated tools uh, than the U.S. government most of the time. Uh, no offense. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the point is that the current thinking may be that based on the last five years, uh, congressional sentiment, which is, as we know, very far-reaching and long-lived, up to and on the day of the next election, uh, is, is likely to not think necessarily about the broader historical trend. Okay, so what's been going on? I'm going to take you, like Congress, into recent memory. Uh, in, uh, in March, DOE conducted uh, a test sale. Uh, we like to refer to it as a test with benefits uh, because it was uh, sufficient in terms of the revenues it raised to fund the creation of a products reserve uh, located at three sites in, in the Northeast for a million barrels of gasoline. Uh, and still, uh, thanks to the precipitous drop in crude prices, uh, purchased back essentially all the oil that was sold uh, for the same amount of money. Well done, guys. Maybe you are very good traders. Uh, now, the, there were several things that happened subsequent to that. Uh, the Department of Energy's Office of Inspector General did a report on the SPRO. Uh, the general, uh, sorry, the Government Accountability Office, dating myself there. Uh, the GAO did a report on, uh, on, this, on the SPRO in, in the context of crude exports. Uh, and there was, uh, there was also uh, the Cromnibus uh, Bill, which is one of those, those Elysian acronym things that happens only in Washington, understood by no one. For those who are blissfully outside the Beltway, that was the continuing resolution slash omnibus appropriations bill, which blocked the subsequent creation of future products reserves without the involvement of Congress. Interesting. Uh, then there, of course, was the, uh, the QER, uh, which uh, made, made some comments about this pro. And, uh, and of course, uh, Chris Smith appeared just last week before the House Energy and Commerce's uh, Subcommittee on Energy and Power, where he gave uh, very eloquent testimony similar to what you heard today. So what did we learn from these things? Well, the OIG report uh, it mentions a crude oil fill level. Uh, this would be uh, pointing to a size discussion. Question about right-sizing the SPRO surfaces. We see in the GAO report uh, questions about DOE has not recently re-examined the size. Well, this is an interesting idea. Are we holding excess crude oil that could be sold to fund other national priorities? 
perish the thought. Such a thing could never happen, except that it did uh, three times in 1996 and early 1997 for the total of 28.1 million barrels sold in three non-emergency sales, the first of which you could argue was done because a cavern had to be emptied, but the next two were done because Congress started to like the way it felt to sell crude. Uh, but wait, it's happened more recently. As I think you may recall, we had an emergency sale uh, in June of 2011, 30 million barrels of crude in a coordinated IEA action, and in the context of that raised $3.2 billion, which went into the SPR petroleum account, where it sat until Congress took it in what was effectively an ex post facto fundraising sale. That money was no longer available to buy back crude for the SPRO because that money had gone to the general account, the general fund of the Treasury. So uh, does this sort of thing happen? Yes, it does happen. Is GAO saying maybe you want to do it? Maybe they are. But then Congress responds to the, the diversification into products by saying no. I mean, that's essentially what those words say. None may be used unless we say you can use it. And by the way, if you're thinking about doing any more products reserves, why don't you ask us first? Thanks. Um, OK, so that was in an appropriations bill. Uh, so we get the impression that maybe Congress is protective of the SPRO. They want to keep it the way it is. Uh, they don't want the DOE going off and, and right-sizing it or modernizing it or optimizing it unless they have a, a robust discussion. Well, the QER comes out and says, we think we should have a robust discussion. We, DOE, who are already studying this, and the EPSA group, which is looking at everything, all things energy across the government, has come up with the conclusion that, yes, a robust discussion is worthwhile. And so it would happen that uh, the Honorable uh, Secretary Smith was appearing before the committee last week in which 15 members managed to show up for a discussion about the SPRO which is not to say that out of a committee of the size and scale of the Energy and Commerce Committee is, uh, is uh, you know, surprising, particularly not when someone is as eloquent and pleasant to talk to as, as Secretary Smith was there, but it did stand out because eight of those were Democrats, seven were Republicans, and fully seven of that 15 made comments that said, hey, maybe we should look at the size of the SPRO. What's going on here? Are we protecting against changes or are we eager for changes? Well. Uh, there's one way to look at it, uh, which is that if $15 billion is what you can raise by selling at about $55 a barrel, the notional surplus above the 90-day theoretical net import cover, then that's $15 billion that can be spent, obviously, on the most urgent energy policy priorities of the U.S. government or anything else the U.S. government might wish to spend it on. Uh, and that, of course, is one of the risks uh, associated with the, the ongoing debate. Uh, one of the things that it could be spent on, though, is the thing that DOE spent it on last time, which was the diversification into products. Uh, oh, and, and the time before last, too. What you have here is the five-year average of Pad 1 middle distillate inventories uh, up to uh, 2000, uh, so prior to the creation of the New England Home Heating Oil Reserve. Uh, which, was, uh, which was done uh, during the Clinton administration to protect against the risk of a supply disruption and or price issue in New England. Uh, the black line at the bottom and the, the several lines you see are the annual inventory levels on a, a week basis during the years that followed. And you will notice that they fall below the bottom of the range. Now, this isn't a very fair analysis because there's a lot of reasons why inventory levels fall below the bottom of the range. But one potential explanation for it is that private entities who are currently investing their precious working capital in inventories might look upon the government choosing to invest in inventories and decide, well, if they're doing it, why should I? I have higher productive uses of that capital. I'm not saying for sure and in a definitive statistically guaranteed sort of way that the inventories uh, that the private entities in Pad 1 were holding were eliminated, uh, taken up by the government at taxpayer expense for the same net energy security benefit, but it is a risk, a free rider risk, and that is one reason why Congress may have said, hey, let's talk about this products reserves thing before you go and do it again. There is a second reason which came up in Bob McNally's question, I think, earlier in, in the session, which was the question of whether or not there is a political motivation to release reserves whether the context for the release of that reserves could be done uh, specifically for the benefit of a local population. As Secretary Smith mentioned, the SPR for crude is a national resource with national and global ramifications. Regional products reserves are regional resources, which mean that they can have local political impacts. I would say that we are, we are yet to have a robust refined products reserve debate, but it's coming. And uh, those two arguments, those two elements of discussion likely to be included among them. Uh, thank you. You've been very kind. Look forward to the discussion.
Great. So we've got about 15 minutes left for discussion. I know there's a lot of folks in the audience with deep expertise on the issue. One of the things I wanted to do is forego my own question and give uh, someone who actually worked on the SPR portion of the QER an opportunity to maybe say a few short words just on the raison d'etre of the SPR uh, from the QR's perspective, just to add that additional element to the discussion. I know there's a few other people in the room who've also worked on this for a long time. Welcome you to make some comments, but we do want to be able to get in other people's questions as well. So if we could move through it quickly. Uh, Carmine DeFiglio, you want to um, take the first whack? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to mention that, uh, especially given the last presentation, that uh, the basic economic rationale for the holding reserves has been a debate for quite a long time. After the oil price collapse in the 80s, after the oil price spikes in the 70s, there's been a continuing economic debate whether or not oil price spikes really hurt the domestic economy or not. And uh, a lot of people had, uh, some economists had theories that, well, they were caused by the Fed uh, having an overly strict uh, monetary policy. Well, since then, a lot's happened. Uh, we've had continued uh, examples of oil price spikes, and they've also caused uh, depressions in economic growth, both in the U.S. and in the world. And, and there's been a lot of statistical studies about the sensitivity of, uh, of uh, purchases of gasoline and oil with respect to uh, gasoline or oil prices. And in order to, you know, go into this question of the SPR, one of the things we want to look at is, especially given that um, U.S. oil imports are, are decreasing and expected to decrease further. Uh, is there still a necessity of the SPR to protect the domestic economy from oil price dis disruptions and oil supply disruptions? And the QER uh, took a good look at this, the, and there is a clear statement in the QER that the, despite the change of the U.S. and the world oil market in our more prominent role, that without the protection of the SPR, the uh, domestic economy is still vulnerable to disruption from international oil supply disruptions. And, and that uh, is a, that's something that we haven't abandoned as, as a basic principle behind the SPR. In addition uh, of the legislative changes that we're making, again, given some of the discussion, there's nothing in the QER uh, recommendations that would be giving the president authority to uh, release the SPR simply because oil prices have gone up. Uh, there is a recommendation to uh, change, uh, a very small change in a section called, this is very arcane, 161D, that in order for the president to have an unrestricted release of the SPR, he has to find that the disruption has caused domestic product prices to increase levels that have already damaged the U.S. economy. We'd like to see that, say, are expected to damage the U.S. economy because it's pretty clear that the SPR is more effective in preventing a price increase rather than bringing prices down after they've gone up. So there's nothing in the QER that's suggesting that the SPR be used as a way of managing oil prices. Thank you. I'd like to welcome other questions from the audience. Uh, if there are some, if not, I'm going to start going on mine. John. Uh, John Shag of Strategic Petroleum Consulting. Uh, Mr. Young, you uh, outrightly said the IEA is against managing oil prices, and then you went on to buttress that argument by saying legislation said it was illegal. Uh, the first real serious use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was a 30 million barrel exchange, the largest drawdown in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in year 2000 by the Clinton administration. Are you implying that that was illegal because it was strictly for price purposes? No, <laughs> I wasn't actually referring to the U.S. Um, uh, legislation at that point. I was actually referring um, to German legislation for their agency, EBV. It's very clear that um, they can only use their stocks if there's a clear disruption. And it's, so I was not referring to the U.S. <laughs> 
Martin, it does make me uh, want to just follow up on that really quickly, and then we'll go to Bob's question. Is you had mentioned that you know there is a variety of approaches, and both in terms of size and composition and governance of. Uh, strategic stocks within the global stock system. It was actually one of your colleagues uh, here not too long ago, Antoine Hoff, who has uh, sort of expressed this changing nature of uh, global oil trade flows from one that's more sort of product heavy, less crude focused, and, and has a lot of different sort of directional dynamics to it that led us to asking some of these questions about um, uh, on, a, on a broader basis, even outside, but you know, hopefully informing the U.S. SPR conversation, this broader conversation within the international strategic stock system about how well positioned uh, uh, we are for, uh, for, for the oil markets going forward. Is there, is there work that you have done, are doing, considering anew on some of the things that have worked well or not well? Uh, in the context of the global strategic stock system that uh, you wanted to share with us at all? Uh, we've reviewed um, the effectiveness of uh, the recent collective actions. There was a lot of work after the um, after Katrina collective action, which um, resulted in some things being sharpened up amongst our member countries. There's been, there was a, a long debate post the Libyan collective action uh, about sharpening things up. Um, I think probably in the, in the short to medium term, I think this current system is, is fine. Um, the real issue is where the huge growing demand from China and India and making sure that they have emergency systems that um, work in the same grain as the, the current systems. Um, and that's where there is a lot of work um, with these countries trying to see if we can do things with them um, I touched upon the uh, agreement the U.S. has got with China where about sharing expertise. Um, and I think that's really beneficial because we know that the, the Chinese have got an SPR. Um, we actually had an exercise um, in January where we, um, we did one of our exercises. I'll speak a little bit closer to it as well. <laughs> and we had an exercise in, in January in China where um, we were did a, a global disruption, and we had a lot of Chinese industry involved. Um, we know the Chinese have an SPR. We don't know what their release processes are. Um, the question is, do they actually know what their release processes are? We would actually like to make sure that, in due course, that they could align with what we're doing. Um, India's another case where they are building their SPR. I think they've actually now started filling it. Again, we'd like to know and be able to work with them on the release processes so when disruption do come in the future, we can try and maintain the effectiveness of the existing system. Uh, thank you, Bob McNally. Um, I'll invite uh, Kevin and anyone on the panel to respond to the question. I guess I want to repose the question I asked earlier. Uh, recalling that the 2000 time exchange, the only one of the releases we saw on the screen that didn't have the words storm, war, collective action, uh, was announced 60 days before a national election in which President Clinton invited then-candidate Al Gore to announce that, uh, and, and perhaps suggesting that there might be some politicization in the use of reserves in even when even more discretion was granted to the government uh, than is already right now. I guess my question is, uh, realizing that rising gasoline prices terrify officials, realizing definition of a disruption is in the eye of the beholder, when we think about giving more discretion to the government when, when to use a reserve, what mechanisms or procedures might we want to consider to ensure we don't have politicized use of the SPR, which I think we all would agree would be very negative both for national security and market stability? Thank you. I don't know if out there in the, the digital world of permanent information you can find it, but I had the pleasure of sitting on a panel with uh, Energy Secretary Bill Richardson at a, an event hosted by Politico in uh, 2012 at the Democratic National Convention. He actually said something, I can't remember the exact quote, but it, uh, it was something like, sometimes governments use reserves to move prices. 
Uh, now, it's as close as I can get to, uh, I think, you know, the Secretary has uh, other roles and, and perhaps he misremembers uh, the context in which the decision was taken to release those reserves. But if you were to find that footage, I think it might confirm your suspicion. On the other hand, I also think that we might want to consider that maybe that's what they always have wanted to do with reserves. There is a constant tension that goes all the way back, as Carmine mentioned, uh, throughout the, the debate on this, of whether or not this is a, a break glass only in case of emergency type of tool, or whether it's a tool that lends itself to some other use to modulate economic impacts. And I suspect that one of the limiting factors, and, and whether Bob or anyone else can, can speak to it, may be the question of whether or not it can be used tactically given the physical constraints of the facility. Um, could it be used tactically? Um, I, I guess, you know, I, the way that I would look at it as, as the program manager for this, EPCA to me, um, it does have very clear language in terms of release authorities. Now, whether you agree that the release authorities are, are good as written or as the QER has indicated that there really is a need to amend those authorities because they are a patchwork that have occurred through amendments over time to the original law. Um, there are clear authorities, and, and with regards to, to tactical releases, you know, depending on how those authorities are written, if there are changes to the authorities, which would be done by Congress, obviously, um, you could um, you could potentially uh, utilize the SPR, you know, for uh, meeting the release requirements in the law, but do it such that, as I mentioned previously, under the 161D for a full drawdown right now, it requires on the economic side that a, an, an adverse impact has already occurred. And that's what the, I think the point that Carmine was making also, is that where it, not to be utilized necessarily as a price maintenance mechanism, but think of it more as an econ overall economic deterrent in the sense that you have a potential physical supply disruption, say there's tensions in the Middle East, um, there, uh, the waterways are starting to get choked off because of, even if there's no actual fighting, but you know shipments are, are, are slowing down or something like that that starts to drive global crude oil prices up. Um, there is the potential for a physical supply disruption in, in that particular case. Um, at that point in time, it is extremely likely that the IEA member com countries are going to be talking about what potentially could be done. And if there was a collective action, that the collective action could be as a result of rather than waiting until prices go all the way up to say $170 a barrel, if you're at $130 a barrel, but all the economists agree that if something were to occur, it's going to go up to $170 a barrel, then you do something at that point in time. Martin Tellett, one of the things I wanted to do is maybe ask you to address something that Kevin Book raised in his um, uh, in his remarks, which doesn't get nearly as much attention, I think, as the um, as the size or composition or strategic, you know, use sort of question, but but maybe in your real house a little bit, I guess, is this ownership question, right? So if if changes in the strategic petroleum reserve in whatever direction, either to have more products or to um, to be in a different location or to be a different size would necessitate infrastructure investments, right? There is an economic efficiency argument to be made that perhaps the system that you have that's already designed to deliver products where it's needed most is, is, is perhaps the most efficient system at already doing that anyway, right? So using existing commercial stocks, but just having more of them at places where you feel like you might need them, but them not being government owned necessarily, or there would have to be some sort of, you know, ownership and operatorship arrangement. 
Is that something that has come up in some of the strategic reviews that you've looked at in the past over the capability of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to respond to different um, kinds of oil supply disruptions? Just because I know you look at it in, in sort of a, a global context and also very much understand uh, sort of the, the, the international environment for, um, uh, for this as well. So I don't know if that's something you've ever really thought about in terms of ownership structure of the SPR as one of the options on the table to, that's relevant to be evaluated? That was quite a long question. Uh, the, the, short answer, the short answer is no, uh, but uh, I mean, we have looked at instances, we, we were involved in the uh, report to Congress that led to the Northeast Heating Oil Reserve, for example. Um, we were involved in another report to Congress which was looking at the uh, vulnerabilities of the U.S. insular areas. So we, we focused on um, the um, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and I guess if I were to think back, there, there probably were ownership questions that came up at that time. Not that we really got particularly into those, but I guess one comment I would have is, is for Martin the Younger here. And... Uh, because uh, this is really much more the European model, right, of, of um, requiring commercial entities to maintain a certain level of stocks. The government doesn't necessarily, well, there are stocks that the government owns, but outside of that, the main, the main requirement is on commercial entities, yes? It's not, it's not necessarily European. Um, the European obligation system is slightly different. Its focus is on actual products, so there is part of that. A number of uh, European countries do impose obligations on industry, but also uh, Japan does as well, um, and I think Korea. Um, in those systems, it is slightly different because you are asking industry to hold a set amount which could be above their operational stock levels, uh, and then they can recover that cost from consumers. Um, there are different approaches. It all depends on the national system and how you want to defend against the, the risks, mitigate the risks that you're dealing with. Yeah, you, you showed this chart on uh, Pad 1A stocks after Nihor. Um, Pad 1A is really different than all the other pads and subpads because it's there to store heating oil, uh, where all the other subpads and pads, their uh, stocks are to store diesel fuel. It's like 90 plus percent diesel fuel in, in those pads and almost all heating oil in Pad 1A. Now, after Nihor, something happened. Oil prices started skyrocketing. And as a response to that, um, in Pad 1A, people got out of heating oil. They used other things. So heating oil demand plummeted in Pad 1A. In fact, it's pretty much the only pad where heating oil existed in the first place. Diesel fuel wasn't changed because obviously trucks have to go and don't, don't care about what the oil prices are. So it might have been just a coincidence that you had Nihor and then a plummet in, uh, in heating oil stocks because people moved out of heating oil. I absolutely agree. It might have been just a coincidence. But it raises a question. Uh, and so what I was trying to do by illustrating that is to, to give you two dimensions of the policy debate around products reserves. You've heard the IEA and others say they think products reserves are good. We know that Sandy created disruptions that products reserves can solve. So if they're all good, what's the downside? One potential downside could be an adverse incentive to industry. Another potential downside could be the political use thereof. But I absolutely agree with you, Carmine. It's possible that it's merely coincidental, uh, and, uh, and I would agree uh, officially. Okay, uh, Jim, last question. Yes, my name is Jim Hart. I spent a few years representing the U.S. in oil emergency matters at the IEA. Uh, first a comment and then a question on the, on the 2000 heating oil exchange. Um, at the time, heating oil stocks were extremely low. We were very concerned about the coming winter, and we wanted to do everything possible to uh, encourage refiners to make heating oil. And the only thing we had was crude oil. So we did an exchange. 
that's my story. It was my story then. It's my story now. <clears throat> Secondly, for Mr. Corbin, a, a close reading of the QER and then looking at EPCA, the law, Energy Policy and Conservation Act, it seems you're, you're making some edits, but in effect, adding no authorities. Has the administration considered uh, adopting a policy on how it would implement EPCA as previous administrations have done? <laughs> I, I would I direct you to the, the Reagan administration, the Clinton administration, et cetera, had a policy on how they intended to implement those authorities and the law. The authorities are fine, but what you intend to do is even more important. So I, I, I signaled to Bob to keep the answer to that question short, and he responded by deflecting it to me, which was, <laughs> which was, which was very skillfully done, I have to, I have to say, right? Uh, but uh, at any rate, so the, you know, as I think a, a couple of panelists mentioned, and, and I mentioned my comments, you know, our challenge with EPCA is that it, it's this Frankenstein, or, or the EPCA as it, 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 as it appears now. I mean, it started out with a certain very clear um, goal in terms of, dealing with disruption of physical barrels. Um, over time, it's been amended and changed, and, and now it's the, 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 uh, the legislation that we have now. So, I, and I, would, I wouldn't say anything really specific in terms of what the review is going to, going to recommend, because you know, that's why we're doing the review. That's why we're, we're, we're thinking about these policies. Uh, so, I mean, what I can say is that the, the, the legislation as it exists right now is, uh, uh, it, it's been changed in, in time to the point in which there there are lots of ambiguities about you know what is a disruption and, and, and where and what are what are uh, you know what are the authorities that we have are there authorities uh, regionally and, and locally uh, domestic uh, sorry product versus crude consistent with the, the challenge of the future so um, that's I think the consideration that needs to be made uh, when I had the opportunity to appear before. Uh, House Energy and Commerce uh, several days ago, the, you know, commitment, the commitment that we made was that, you know, the recommendation of the QR thinks that we need to take a look at this, and, and that's something that we'll be doing on a, on a go-forward basis. Uh, we've gone over time a little bit, so I'm going to let everybody go. We do have some questions uh, that we'll try and address in our next session on the Jones Act. Uh, about how Jones Act crude oil exports and uh, all of this relate to one another. So I'll spare, uh, spare the panel from having to answer those. Um, but uh, thank you very much for joining us here today. We think this will be an ongoing discussion and look forward to uh, pursuing it in our work. So thanks very much to you guys and to Christmas for joining us. <laughs>